It's Nicola here at the Disasters Emergency Committee at the end of the second week of our East Africa Crisis Appeal. And I'm delighted today to be joined by Raggy Omar from ITV News. For many of the British public, uh, Raggy's reporting from Somaliland earlier this month will have been the first time that they really saw the scale of the crisis affecting um, Somalia, Somaliland and Puntland. So Raggy, tell us about your trip to Somaliland and what you saw. Well, it was relatively um, intense and short, uh, both uh, at the same time, because um, we'd gone without really knowing what to expect. This was, um, even though the DEC and other uh, of its um, NGO partners had been warning for quite a long while of um, the impending sort of um, uh, crisis in, in the region and, and much beyond, um, there hadn't really been an enormous amount of um, media involvement and pickup. I mean, whether in print or in uh, broadcasting or to a certain extent online. So we left um, committed to do the story, but not knowing really what it is we would find. Um, and uh, we decided um, to try and just travel as much through um, the country in Somaliland uh, uh, to see where we could find. So we traveled right from the border with Ethiopia, but initially we went to the far east, uh, to Sol and Sanag area provinces of uh, um, Somaliland bordering with Puntland. And why did we choose uh, Somaliland? After all, this was a crisis that was happening in you know all of the Somalia, um, uh, Yemen, uh, South Sudan, um, and North Nigeria. Um, I think if, in all of those areas, even though a colleague, John Ray, was reporting at the same time as me from South Sudan, Somaliland was speaking just in terms of just logistically the, the most um, accessible area that we could operate as a journalist without very, very heavy security concerns. Um, it's not as easy. I mean, as it's quite obvious to travel in northern Nigeria, where the area is um, uh, held and, you know, by Boko Haram militants. A lot of uh, southern Somalia is unfortunately um, insecure because of the threats of, you know, al-Shabaab and, and other militants. So as a journalist, you need to be able to go and do your job and see the story um, and stay for several days without having to sort of be accompanied by huge amounts of armed guards. Um, that was possible in, uh, in, in Somaliland. So. Um, we went, and pretty soon after we arrived, I think about a day after we arrived, I remember we arrived, I think it was on a Friday, if I remember correctly, um, we were traveling on our way by the Saturday, and immediately, I mean, we were able to find, um, see for ourselves just the scale of uh, how bad mm -hmm. things were. And so, were you surprised by what you saw? Was it, was it worse than you'd expected? Um, it was. I mean, uh, given the fact that I was already uh, in the region, I mean, visiting, I mean, not for a reporting assignment in December of last year. So that's, I mean, part of the reason why we at ITV decided to go and, and commit to the story quite quickly. It was quite obvious, not only with the warnings of DEC and a lot of the sort of um, uh, uh, members, the 13 agencies within it, but also I was able to see, um, you know, on the ground myself through, you know, Somaliland journalists, the media there internally was sort of beginning to cover it. But of course, I mean, um, it was just the sheer scale of and what hit you first in the, the principal pictures that we started recording almost immediately after we arrived was just the extent to which livestock and cattle had been lost. I mean, in Somaliland alone, I mean, leaving aside all the other sort of regions uh, uh, and areas covered by this sort of crisis, I think uh, out of a total livestock population of 18 million, 10 million were lost. Now, to put that into perspective, I mean, the Somaliland uh, government relies, I think, up to about 76% of its national income through livestock exports. So, you know, suddenly when, mm -hmm. you know, a huge amount, you know, nearly, you know, over half of that livestock is dead, well, imagine the impact of the government's mm -hmm. capacity to earn income, to, you know, supply um, uh, hospitals, uh, clinics, um, you know, wells, um, all that kind of stuff. So it's quite clear that something serious was 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 happening, even within uh, uh, Hargeisa, the capital. Um, it has one. The whole country has one general referral hospital. Now, as a country, I mean, you know, Somaliland, you know, is, is has a population of four million. So that has a sec, uh, uh, um, a therapeutic, a pediatric therapeutic, therapeutic sort of feeding centre supported by, actually helped by um, UKID um, and uh, UNICEF and uh, and um, other sort of you know partners, uh, you know which um, work alongside DEC, and there you are finding the whole ward. I mean, there's, um, you know we're, we're full. 
um, mothers had traveled all the way from the east. We're talking, I mean, it took us, I mean, two days to travel by car, four wheel drive. So you can imagine how long it took them to travel there. Um, they were having the children, some of the children were having to be spread into other general pediatric wards because there was just no room sort of left. So that was already a sort of warning sign because in some ways the children arriving at that ward were the ones that had made it to a therapeutic mm -hmm. feeding centre were in some ways, you know, safe. And we did see almost immediately the effects that, you know, the, the amount of aid that was available there could have. I mean, within... You know, there's one child who sort of arrived, and of course, it's all the sort of associated diseases with uh, with, with acute malnutrition yeah. that um, you start. To, but within a short period of time, with the sort of you know the the therapeutic feeding, with you know uh, medical care, within you know a couple of days, you could see an improvement. Uh, but the real concern was what was happening in the hinterland. So, um, just to go back to the the picture about the cattle, mm. um, you know, the figures about the cattle. I was really struck in your mm. report um, on that with the ten million. Mm. It really, really struck me, mm. and um, how much of the the income of the country would be destroyed. Mm. It really was an incredible figure. Mm. And one of the things that I've heard um, since, um, you know, in, in aid workers coming mm. back from the field, is meeting children who saw their families. Um, camels or cattle mm. dying and then saying where are they going to be next yeah no the that's children. very true i mean i remember one instance i mean on the main road to the ethiopian border which is in an area called gebile which is the most fertile part of somalia in the sense that that's where you know grain and pasture is grown so you found families who traveled all the way from the east who were nomads who relied on sort of you know cattle and livestock principally sheep and goats actually trekking all the way to this sort of western area. Um, huge amounts of their herds had already died. Um, and they had separated out the last remaining sort of um, sheep and goats. So obviously those uh, sheep and goats that had clearly weren't going to make it were penned in, you know, in, in one little area of the settlement, whilst the others that might survive were penned off. In, I and mean, it was really a, a quite a, a shocking and stark illustration of you know, the, the, the very short gap yeah. between life and sort of death. So in one corner, you had the sheep that, you know, weren't going to survive, you know. And in fact, that morning that we arrived, one, you know, sheep had already died and they hadn't even, the family hadn't picked up um, uh, the, the carcass. A lot of other areas um, in uh, uh, slightly further, right near the border with Ethiopia in a place called Magala, had, you'd had um, hundreds of families from the east who'd come in expecting to find, but, you know, you ask why would they come all that way? It's because they thought, well, if we go to the area where there's pasture, where we know, you know, corn and, you know, sorghum and all these sort of things, barley are sort of grain, there might be some grazing for our, what remains of our herds. Not knowing that the drought had also completely affected them. And there were no, there was no pasture, you know, there were no fields of sort of, you know, um, uh, barley or, or, or maize. So that was quite stark. I mean, you did see some... Again, you know, there was a well dug by Islamic Relief, I mean, a, a member of the sort of, you know, DEC, and it was amazing to see the effect that that one little well, you know, was having. So, um, and of course, they, they, the, the villagers and, and the mayor had begun to dig just sort of shallow trenches, really, lined with tarpaulin, um, to get water from the well to, you know, and I asked, how much does it cost to, you know, what, what does it cost you to fill this trench? And he said about 40, you know, he said $50, so it's about 40 odd pounds. And I said, how much would that last? And he said, well, that supplies, you know, about, a, you know, 150 people and their animals, by the way, uh, about, you know, a week to 10 days. So it gives you a scale of what, you know, 50 pounds can do. Um, uh, so um, that's really the sort of effect as you say, if you know, if 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 the animals are going, I mean, you know, dying and being affected by this, it's only a short matter of time before humans are, because the relationship between the two is incredibly stark. Because they, you know, the it was interesting because once the they weren't even able to sell their last few animals because they were all they were skin and bone. So even if they took it to market in the urban areas, which they'd made it to, no one was buying the the, the, the animals. So their income was lost. And I mean, the other interesting thing that you touch on there is the, the scale of this drought. So mm. we, you know, as you said before, conflict has played a role does, in, yeah. in what, this, what the situation faced in Somalia at the moment. But also on top of that, there's an unprecedented level of drought. And mm. I know from your reporting, just the endless mm. terrain that was mm. dried out mm. was incredible. Did you, yeah. did you see that? Yes, it was. I mean, uh, and uh, you really see it from um, some of the pictures we were able to 
get, we sent, we, we, we took a drone that was mounted with a camera because it's only then you can really see from an aerial. And uh, one thing that really stays with me is just these huge, wide wadis, these, you know, rivers that should be, and I'm talking, you know, maybe, you know, 60, 70 feet across, huge, you know, uh, rivers that should be coursing, you know, with, with, with fresh rainwater, completely and utterly sort of dry. I mean, again and again and again, we just crossed, traversed these sort of dry riverbeds. Um, and, you know, the same is true when you talk of sort of Somalia, um, you know, uh, um, an enormous impact there in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the droughts and also conflict. I mean, that has also just, you know, these aren't, you know, really entirely natural disasters. I mean, when you talk about South Sudan, certainly Nigeria, certainly Somalia, certainly Yemen, the one factor that ties it all in together is um, conflict and 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 you know social dislocation um, and uh, and again you've got diseases of cholera I think being a very big problem in uh, in, in southern Somalia in the Bay region um, and I know that even in the few days when we were there in Somaliland I mean the uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres had gone down and seen for himself in in Baidur, um the the enormous impact uh, 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 there um, so yes, it is essentially man-made, but complicated by drought. And I mean, you've painted an interesting picture of some of how the, the aid um, is being used, because uh, there's a couple of things that we've been asking our donors to donate to, and you've talked about the water and the importance of that, and how far that £40, mm. $50 mm. contribution goes. And you touched on earlier about the therapeutic feeding mm. centres and the, the mm. health centres mm. where they take children mm. to. So we have two um, amounts we ask, £25 to mm. um, provide a month's supply of life-saving peanut paste, mm. plum peanut, for a child, and also £100 to, mm. to help provide supplies to one of those clinics. Can you talk a bit more about some of the children you saw there receiving yeah. that type yeah, of aid? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, there was one, I mean, in fact, two young boys. I mean, first of all, um, there was one boy called uh, Hamza and another one called Abdurrahman, and they were, um, you know, one was, I think, if I remember right, 18 months. And if I correctly remember, I mean, he should have weighed about eight kilos, but in fact weighed five kilos. So what is what is five kilos? I mean, in, in the UK, people understand, you know, five, you know, bags of sugar, that's it. I mean, it's just, just not, not a lot at all. Um, uh, and the two-year-old boy, you know, should have weighed, I think, about sort of 12 kilos and weighed eight. But within a very short sort of space of time, again, you know, we were there for about, you know, 10 days or so. You know, the effect, you weren't obviously going to see, uh, you know, their body weight come back up in that. So although you did see, you know, certainly from their face, um, much, much sort of livelier, and you know, but it's just the fact that their body was able to fight back against the disease and and um, vulnerabilities that your um, you know acute malnutrition you know brings. I mean, one of them had uh, a fever, um, and within a sort of overnight, we we sort of visited him the night before. The next day, he was just you know just was the fever had broken. So twenty five pounds for you know high protein pumpy nuts you know um, to feed a child for what is it a month or yeah, so? Month. Um, that's you know think of what twenty five pounds means in the in in the UK. Mm -hmm. It's not an insignificant amount of money, but to save a child's life and to give them the high protein they need for over a month. I mean the figure that stays with me is simply because um, we spent a lot of time in that one and only therapeutic <laughs> feeding centre in the, in the in in a hospital in the whole country is that a hundred pounds I think can. Um, help supply uh, a clinic for a month. Yes, that's right. For a month. So that just, you know, we were there for a week. So the, the idea that, you know, £100 could just, you know, go such an enormous way is, uh, is, 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 is amazing. And, I mean, as we've talked about, there's complex reasons for the situation in, in all mm. of East Africa. Um, but there are a lot of innocent victims caught up in it. Yeah. And I know people often ask, you know, about providing humanitarian aid when there's wider issues. But can you explain why, I mean, ITV have done some amazing reporting mm. on this story, why they got behind it so much? I think it's several reasons. Um, one, because I think that um, we were able to work with agencies that were already on the ground, I and mean, we made contact with, you know, lots of different sort of um, uh, member agencies of DEC who have staff and offices, you know, country offices there, we were able to work with Somaliland sort of journalists who'd been able to sort of see the areas. It's that sort of perfect sort of alchemy where you have, 
you know, humanitarian intelligence, as I like to call it, uh, and, and, and input, as well as sort of, you know, um, you know, local journalists who really know the lay of the land and can take you to those, you know, stories. Because the one thing that's very difficult if you're, to, as a journalist, trying to bring these complex emergencies to the British public into people's homes is, you know, you can't really just drive around aimlessly looking for where the right, you know, stories are on the scale of it. You have to really, you know, know where you're going. So that's partly it. I think also partly it was, you know, I've had the benefit of spending time about a month before we went with uh, Priti Patel, who's the Secretary of State for International Development. She was actually in the region. I joined her in Ethiopia. And we were talking with her and her sort of, you know, the, the different staff about this unique situation of, as the EC had been warning of, of, you know, the first time in living memory uh, of having the world facing four simultaneous famines at the same time spread across, you know, from Nigeria and West Africa to Yemen in the Arabian Peninsula, and which is, of course, what Stephen O'Brien, the, the UN's uh, head of humanitarian affairs, you know, uh, addressed the Security Council saying this was unique ever since the creation of the UN, you know, since the Second mm -hmm. World War, you know, the organization never faced anything like this. So I think it was that sort of, it was, it was knowing that something was coming to a head and having at the sort of grassroots level, something to, know, you know, journalists and humanitarian organizations um, working with us. And also, I think, I think we just made a commitment that we were just going to go, you know, sometimes, you know, you you in as, as, as a journalist you just decide to commit to something and you know um, find what you can find but um, it's just you know it's not trying that was the, 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 the thing that we didn't want to do. And I mean as you say it's an unprecedented situation and to all of us you know just flabbergasting in many ways that people are facing starvation mm. in 2017 when mm. we have so much mm. here in the UK but one of the other things that we've been very surprised by is how generous the, in the, the British public has been incredibly mm. generous. Mm. We're um, on 40 million that yeah. we've raised in the past two weeks. Um, and there have also been other sort of you know humanitarian mm. crises in the last sort of two years that you know they've given mm. generously too. But you're right, yeah. So I think that they have through the images that mm. um, ITV News and BBC mm. and mm. Channel Four, Channel mm. Five, Sky have brought mm. to our yeah. screens. People see that these are the innocent yeah. victims. That yes. Even though some of the ways to resolve these issues mm. might take longer, right mm. now people yeah. are dying. I think people see a need, uh, and I think that's what they saw in the in the, in the coverage. And what I was amazed by, even on the day that you announced the uh, appeal, was just how very quickly the money started to roll in. And as I understand it, and not just sort of just twenty pounds. I mean, people were giving you know up to you know average. You said of seventy or seventy or eighty, 70 or 80 pounds. No, which is, we have which incredibly is, generous, which supporters. is an amazing amount of money. I mean, in in this time and at this particular time for individuals and yeah. sort of families to give, you know, seventy eighty pounds is 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 amazing. Uh, and the only thing I can sort of say, because the one thing I'm always asked is, you know, does this will this get through? You know, will this sort of help? And I think it does, because even though these are man-made, ultimately, you know, situations. You've had, you know, aid workers being killed in South Sudan. You've got, you know, violence, unfortunately, rearing its head in Somalia in, in and around sort of, you know, Mogadishu this last sort of week, you know, attack after attack for political reasons. You're dealing with member agencies who have been working in these environments for 30, 40, 50 years yeah. um, all over the world. So this isn't you know, uh, uh, aid agencies who are unused to working in this area, in these kind of environments. So you're dealing with experienced sort of people, experienced NGOs, uh, who have got, you know, staff, you know, on the ground. So yes, I mean, my view is wherever I've gone in the last sort of 25 years, and you've seen these kind of emergencies, the question to will my, you know, money get through is it, it almost always does get through and it almost always does, you know, uh, help save lives. Well, we will be over the coming weeks and months reporting back to you on how that aid um, does get through. But uh, before we finish this Facebook Live session, Raggy was telling me that he did a Facebook Live right. in Somaliland. <laughs> it was the first we ever there. Facebook Live, I think. Um, <laughs> it was the very first Facebook Live. And we did it actually from the clinic that I was talking about in Hargeisa Group Hospital. And uh, so uh, hopefully the next time we get to do one, it'll be with better news. I'm sure it will be, given you know how much money is rolling in. Well, we do hope it will be with better mm -hmm. news then. So we're coming to the end of the second week of um, the launch phase of our DEC East Africa crisis appeal. 
Um, so that means it will be the last Facebook Live for now. Um, we may come back to you over the coming months with more information on how your generous donations have been spent. So, and do keep updated on our Facebook, Twitter and other social media channels to see how your very generous donations have been spent. But as I said, um, so far today um, we've raised £40 million from the very generous British public. So thank you so much and thank you, Reggie. Thank you. Thank you.